you're skipping kind of all the traditional steps that you could go through to go out and find your community, to build a following, to try things out with your brand and your product ideas. I, we believe that's just going to continue and get more and more sophisticated. Hello, I'm Michael Hainsworth. The CIBC Innovation Banking Podcast explores the world of startups, growth stage companies, and late stage companies that have made a big splash in their industries around the world. There comes a time when a startup founder needs to turn over the reins of their company to a more seasoned CEO. The Founder's Dilemma is a topic of many books and conversations in MBA classrooms. Some founders hold on too long and the company fails to accelerate its growth to capitalize on the momentum. Others don't get out of their own way at all and the company fails to maintain that first mover advantage. Turning over the reins is a major turning point for any founder but what about the view from the incoming CEO? Tom Kaiser more than quadrupled the valuation of Zendesk. He replatformed the parent company of Victoria's Secret and the Gap for e-commerce. And he stepped into the role of Hootsuite CEO to scale up the social media management platform, just as COVID-19 created a global pandemic and the uncertainty surrounding it. Kaiser tells me this wasn't the first time he stepped into the breach. That's a lot of fun. Uh, this is my uh, my third time working with a founder. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with the founder of uh, Limited Brands when I was working in retail. And then when I went over to Zendesk, I, I worked directly with the, the founder there, Michael Svein, uh, as his CIO and COO. And then this opportunity with Ryan and the Hootsuite opportunity. So, you know, I think you learn a lot each time you work with a founder. Founders bring a special skill set, passion, and insight into what the company does, why the company does what it does, uh, the decisions that were were made to get you to where where you are. And some founders can turn loose of their baby and let it grow, and some founders can't. Uh, and so that was uh, an important part of my interview process and conversations with, with Ryan as I went through the interview process and with the board was really understanding the role of the founder. You know, Ryan uh, initially was chairman of our board while while I came in and has moved into a, a board seat. But just, you know, were there decision rights, were there things that were kind of untouchable as I came into into the role uh, and, you know, how much freedom and flexibility I'd have. And we, we laid out a really clear plan uh, and Ryan's really embraced it. Uh, he's been super supportive from a coaching and guidance standpoint, but he's very much let me run the company. It's gone as well as I could have uh, ever hoped. You mentioned Zendesk, and you scaled it from a $2 billion valuation to a $9 billion valuation company. How do you apply that experience to Hootsuite? Yeah, there's a lot of applicability. I mean, in different areas of business, Zendesk was fo focused on customer support and customer experience. You know, we're focused at Hootsuite on social media management, and helping companies successfully uh, navigate that. But size of company, uh, you know, I joined Zendesk when it was about $200 million. And in revenue, and we got it up to a billion in revenue in the four and a half years I was there. I joined Hootsuite at roughly, we were a little under 200 million uh, in, in revenue, roughly the same size number of people, not growing at the same pace as Zendesk, but certainly with aspirations for that. So very much using the scaling playbook and the, kind of the focus on you know, people uh, and strategy uh, and execution and cadence and using that as an example of, of what's possible for us as a company. What do you take away from working in the fashion industry? You know, the gap, or Victoria's <laughs> Secret. How do you apply that to social media? It, it was quite the experience. I mean, I, I caught the tail end of really the, the rapid growth of specialty retail. Uh, I got to learn a lot about kind of all things retail, both L Brands and at Gap Inc. Uh, they're private label specialty retail. So you design your own products. Uh, you cut deals with manufacturers all over the world to make your own uh, labeled products. You've got massive supply chains to get that product back into your distribution centers, out to your stores, into your e-commerce business. So it was a fantastic educational opportunity for me as I ran technology for both companies and got to to build and support and scale those, uh, supporting growth into big time growth into China. Uh, but what I learned, uh, and I learned it 
you know, hardcore at L Brands and the approach that they use at Victoria's Secret and Bath and Body Works is that you know, the retail business is a weekly business. And you really got to have a cadence and a rhythm and a rigor to how you measure the business and how you react to the business. Uh, and you always have multiple planning horizons going on in retail. You have the immediate, how do we win the next weekend? You're planning for the next season. That product is usually already being made somewhere and you're starting to figure out the flow and the pricing and the marketing. Then you're looking longer term at trends uh, and starting to make bets on colors and fabrics and things like that. It's a, just a great business uh, education to come up in. Uh, and that cadence and rigor is something that I brought into, into tech. Uh, so when I came into Zendesk, and I took over the operational responsibilities. I really wanted us to have not a, a monthly cadence or a quarterly cadence, but a weekly and a biweekly cadence of so looking at the core metrics of the business uh, and really trying to make sure that we understood and were, were really on top of what was going on in the business. So we were able to react and so that we were able to adjust if there were roadblocks. A big part of tech, the supply chain is people. You need talent uh, and you've got to be filling the seats uh, that you've you budgeted for. And so really watching that supply chain of recruiting uh, and people onboarding and getting into seat and getting effective, looking at your leads and your lead opportunities, looking at your competitive blockers that are out there. Lots of similarities to retail, even though it's a little hard to see from a distance, but when you're up close, there's a lot of similarities there. It's hand-to-hand -hand combat every single week that you're trying to win. And I can imagine to your point uh, about finding the right people, that there are a lot of tricks and traps associated with filling those necessary seats. What, what was one of those things that sort of was a, a learning opportunity for you in that sort of hiring process and filling out the necessary team members? Yeah, you know, in retail, we valued experience. We valued uh, a lot of deep retail experience, a lot of deep retail and e-commerce technology experience. So when you were recruiting, you were frequently out recruiting older, more experienced folks. That wasn't the case everywhere. The stores, obviously, the store associates, distribution centers, a lot of those were young folks, but it was a very different mindset. Coming into tech and coming into Zendesk and then into Hootsuite, you're going after a set of expertise, a set of education, uh, but really uh, you're trying to look through that into the capabilities and the possibilities of what that particular talent brings you're looking at it from a much more diverse and much more global standpoint. Tech talent is all over the world. And when you work in technology, you're comfortable leveraging technology. So you're less geographically bound to where people actually are working uh, to get things done. So I think it's it's a very different mindset. I mean, the, the thing that always stood out to me coming into tech from retail, retail, we always looked at all the constraints. There were physical constraints everywhere. You had so much capacity in your supply chain, you had so much capacity in your stores, you had so much capacity in your distribution uh, centers. We only had so much capacity to do things with uh, technology. So you had constraints everywhere that you were working within. Coming into tech, I mean, specifically into SaaS and the cloud-based tech, you know, the thing that stood out to me was there were no constraints. I generally recognize that, but once you're in it and you, you're like, well, how much does that cost to do? No one cares. How much is it going to cost to store that much data or to process that? No one cares. You, you're using the most modern of technologies that are available to you and you're solving a, a problem and you're doing it in many cases constraint free. That doesn't always get to be uh, the answer to things, but that mindset and having people that aren't constrained uh, in their mindset is really, really important uh, to being successful uh, in the in the technology industry. So now that you're large and in charge, what's next for Hootsuite? How do you take it to the next level? Yeah, we're, we're very focused on growth uh, and really evolving our customer base. We have a customer base of almost 200,000 paying customers uh, that are leveraging our product for, you know, simple things, for branding, for publishing um, their messages out for more sophisticated things like advertising across the social platforms, for building more sophisticated content with video becoming bigger and bigger and more, import more important on Instagram and TikTok, um, helping our customers build that set of capabilities, building the analytics around really seeing how successful the things that they're creating are doing. But more and more on the space that we're in, uh, commerce uh, is becoming more and more real and commerce being 
a version of both social commerce where uh, you're matching up uh, an interest that a customer has uh, and serving up ideas, but also the messaging platforms, being able to drop into messaging platforms and having private conversations. So this whole idea of conversations and the evolution of conversations into uh, commerce opportunities and the customer support opportunities, just in more valuable added conversations uh, with your customers is how we see the space evolving. And so what we're doing from a product standpoint, from a go-to-market standpoint is is really evolving our thinking. Uh, we've been very, very focused on the publishing side of the business and we will continue to be, but how do we mature and help our customers mature uh, and leverage these technologies to drive better businesses? So what does an expanded product offering and growth through acquisition look like to Kaiser? It looks like an evolution of Hootsuite from social media management to social customer care and social-based e-commerce. And in the age of COVID-19 and future pandemics, touchless communication is expected to grow exponentially. So once you've got the reins of a 12 year long success story, how do you decide to pivot? Kaiser started with the $60 million purchase of AI chatbot Heyday. Was it tough to convince the board of this new direction? Yeah, so I mean, there, there's a couple things in, in play there. You know, the, the space that we're in, the social platforms have uh, have been around for a little over 10 years now, and we've been right there with them the entire time, starting with Twitter and then expanding across most all of the social platforms as they've evolved. And while there are new social platforms coming online, it's pretty slow uh, for new social platforms joining. I mean, TikTok is the biggest and most recent one but then you got to go all the way back to really Instagram for one that had a big splash like that. And, you know, we've but continued to add more and more sophistication around our core product set and helping our customers become more and more sophisticated in their use of product. But the reality is the space is being changed by commerce uh, and no one really knows how commerce is going to play out. And is it going to displace e-commerce? Is it going to displace store-based commerce? Because there are things you can do in social uh, that are more one-to-one, -one, more personalized, and more singularly focused on a specific product, time that's just a very different uh, buying experience. And so we felt like it was important for us to kind of skate to where the puck is, to use the Canadian analogy of like, this is where the space is going, and it's going to drive and change all of the different things that we do today around publishing, around branding, around advertising, around customer support to be more commerce oriented in nature. And it meant that we needed a really strong focus uh, and alignment with the social platforms, but also with the underlying messaging platforms, because really where we're seeing the most success in, in commerce is the ability for brands to really control the experience and they can control it inside of a, a messaging platform much more than they can uh, on Facebook or on on Instagram. And so uh, as we had conversations with Heyday, we love their leadership team. They had a retail and e-commerce focus. They were very much thought leaders around social commerce. Uh, they had a very modern platform that was growing really rapidly um, and we needed to be a part of that. And so it allowed us to skip a few steps and jump forward uh, with them. We've treated them and funded them like what they are, a startup. You know, they were going through their Series A and we effectively funded their Series A. And so we're continuing to fund and grow that business really rapidly and letting it kind of lead us from a thought leadership standpoint on where the space is going. So I can't imagine this is the last acquisition you're going to make at Hootsuite. So tell me about how the mindset of a growth through acquisition CEO differs from one piloting a startup. Yeah, it's tricky. It's really tricky. Um, the path of M&A for tech companies is, you know, is paved with disasters uh, of distractions and of things that haven't worked out. Uh, lots of good intentions, but things that don't work out. So you have to be really careful from an M&A standpoint. What we've got inside of, of Hootsuite is a, a long history of acquisitions we've done. I don't even know the number, eight-ish, 10 uh, acquisitions over the years, mostly are small you know, tech and talent type of acquisitions. So the way I look at acquisitions is there's a set of capabilities which our customers need, value, and will pay for. And is it a tech stack and a talent stack of people that will fit in well with our culture and our company that we can bring together? And so we're very active out in the space. The space is so dynamic. No one really knows 
where social is going and how organizations and, and businesses are going to leverage it. We just know that more and more businesses are piling in uh, into the space as traditional channels of communication, as traditional marketing channels where they could connect with their customers go away, as this whole uh, influencer kind of economy uh, evolves, the space is changing. And so you've got to be active. We've got to be active out there in what's going on and then look through the lens of should we build it uh, or, or should we uh, buy it? We've not done a raise of any kind financially since uh, like 2013, early 2014. So we're self-funding as well as we go through this. So it gives us a different degree of focus and discipline around what we go buy and a, a lot of rigor uh, around that to make sure that we're buying the right things and then the ultimately we're getting the right returns uh, for what we're, we're buying. Yeah, it's after all your money now. You're not playing with other people's yep. money. That's exactly right. So knowing, as you've just said, no one really knows where social goes from here. From your perspective, what's the social customer care and social commerce world look like post-COVID-19? Yeah, I don't think we go back. We've seen a massive movement onto the social platforms that is sustaining not just people like over the half the world's population is active uh, on on social but you know a rapid movement of businesses of all size and you know this whole movement of the i quit <laughs> situation we're in where so many people are leaving their jobs and uh, in this great resignation and going and starting new businesses and you're starting your businesses straight on social you're skipping kind of all the traditional steps that you go through to go out and find your community, to build a following, to try things out with your brand and your product ideas. I, we believe that's just going to continue and get more and more sophisticated influencers and specifically video influencers uh, are only going to uh, increase their value to brands and their influence around brands. And so we all have to think about kind of what products need to be in place, you know, and how this ecosystem all fits together to create ways for traditional businesses to successfully navigate this. If you look at our customer mix, you know, it's a lot of traditional businesses that are trying to connect very geographically, specifically with a customer and prospect base and communicate with them. Uh, but it's more and more these digital and social first type companies that have a whole different set of needs. And how do you make all of those capabilities and kind of the maturity curves uh, easier and easier for customers to navigate? So we've invest heavily in education. We've got a whole academy process and certification process to help our customers navigate and mature, but also it's embedded in, you know, hundreds of universities are leveraging Hootsuite's Academy uh, sets of products for students to get certified. It's a whole different uh, uh, three college-age kids, uh, one going through marketing. The whole marketing education now is completely different and kind of turned on its head from where it was you know, a decade ago and certainly from where I went through on how technology fits into and how content and content creation and how te technology uh, fits into driving brands and, and marketing. Anyway, a long <laughs> rambling answer there. What was it like stepping into the CEO role during a global pandemic? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't easy. It was uh, not the way I envisioned it. I, you know, I went through the interview process right as the pandemic started. So I didn't really get to meet Ryan. I didn't get to meet the board uh, with one exception. I live in San Francisco. Hootsuite is headquartered in Vancouver. Uh, we've got almost 1,300 employees now, and half of them are in Canada. The border was closed for the first a year and a quarter, uh, I was with the company. So I wasn't able to actually meet any employees as, as well. So you, everyone adjusted, you all had to, to adjust, but I always felt like I was missing something. I felt like, you know, I was recruiting, I was bringing in leadership. We actually brought in uh, some additional board members, but you always feel like you're missing, or at least I do, missing just a little bit of not getting to be able to meet people face uh, to face. And so last fall, as the border opened up, I spent a bunch of time in Canada with uh, the employees that I could meet with, uh, which was fantastic. COVID kicked back up, so we slowed that back down, but we're now starting to pick back up. But you can be very effective. It certainly, there's all kinds of really good kind of work-life balance components to taking away the the commutes that we all have uh, and allowing people the flexibility to work when and uh, how they want to. 
Uh, but there's nothing like being in the room together and having a conversation and solving these together. And we've actually got our first leadership team all together in Vancouver next week, which I can't wait for that to, <laughs> to happen because uh, you can just feel the difference. You can feel the connection in a very different way. I was going to say at the height of the pandemic, but of course we don't really know that. At the start right. of the pandemic, <laughs> yeah. uh, you made employee wellness a business priority. Walk us through that process. Yeah, you know we're we're in the business of people. We can't scale and grow our business without talent. I mean, the beauty of SaaS and the subscription business is you build a framework and a set of capabilities, and the world comes to that, which is great. But ultimately, to grow, you need talent and we were building our people team uh, up. We were evaluating and surveying our employees and trying to listen to our employees. And we could see PTO budgets building. People weren't taking vacation. They were at home. They couldn't go anywhere. They weren't taking time off. Uh, they were tired. They were afraid. We were having lots of these kind of conversations and trying to figure out what to do. And so we landed on, I, I've done in my past in retail, I had done shutdown weeks where you effectively shut down as much of your business. You can, you can never shut the whole business down, but you shut down as much of your business as possible uh, to allow everyone to be on a break during that same time period. So you're not doing the half kind of vacation where you're on vacation, but people are still pounding you with emails and messages and looking for uh, activities to get done. So we decided to explore uh, a wellness week concept. And we also made the decision that we weren't going to reduce our employees' PTO count. So this was just a free week off for our employees. And we had to, we have 200,000 customers. We had to navigate customer support and all kinds of things like that. Um, but it turned out to be really popular. We did it last July. We truly shut it down. Our leadership team uh, honored and did not send messages uh, and honored the week. And it was really, really successful. Our employees enjoyed it and they enjoyed the, the quiet that came from it. And we also did some incentives like some additional incentives to encourage our employees to take vacation as well. And just from a health and well-being standpoint. And so we gave some prizes and some awards and things like that for people to not just carry, keep carrying their vacation, but to go take it uh, as well. And it's painful when you lean into that and you, you lose at different times, a third half or all of your workforce, but you make it up with the employees that are, are ready to be back at work and are fully focused on work when they're there. Tell me more about your employees, uh, particularly uh, about lessons learned. You walked back a contract with the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency. How did that pushback from your employees make Hootsuite a better company? Yeah, that was a tough one. We um, I, I, it was uh, it happened in the first month that I had joined the company, so it, we were in a virtual. We do a lot of work with governments, U.S. government, Canadian government, governments all over the world. We've got a, a product that works really well supporting government agencies. We had a series of criteria that we took each of our prospects through. It was effectively, is this a legal business or not? <laughs> uh, and no, there wasn't really another criteria around who we do business with. And so we had a conversation at the leadership team level. There had been conversations going on around the company uh, around whether this was a good idea or not to work with a such a controversial organization. The use case was, you know, rather, it was very plain and a boring use case for the comms part of that organization. And so we let it go through. And what happened next was, you know, we work in social media, we have a young workforce, they have no problem speaking out. And, and they did, they were not happy with the decision. We have close to 100 employees in Mexico City. We had a lot of employees that had real life experiences uh, with the US immigration. Uh, authority. And, uh, and so we listened. I listened hard. Uh, I was still onboarding and getting to know the company. And as I listened, uh, it kind of exposed a little bit around, you know, social media is wide open. And if you just embrace the beauty of everyone can communicate, that's one thing. But when you're working as an organization, you're a made up a organization made up of people who have uh, beliefs and care uh, about the company and what it stands for. Uh, we recognized that we had not done the work we needed to as a company to really put definition around who we were beyond uh, supporting just freedom of, of speech. And so we uh, we went through the painful process of undoing uh, that contract. I got blasted from every direction 
<laughs> that was my uh, introduction into the world of social media uh, and how <laughs> baptism steps, of uh, fire. Oh my God! Uh, but it was the right decision for us, and as a company, it, it allowed us to really step back. At that point, we were a twelve-year-old company to step back and say, like, "What are our values?" So we, we had uh, the startup values that you always have—you know, grit and hustle and things like that. But like, you know, really, who who are we as a company? And so we went through a, a fairly significant investment of time of building out our guiding principles, really talking about them, about how we would make them real, and then rallying uh, around those. We built out a process called the WhoBiz process where we look at who we actually do business with and we have an escalation process where we can evaluate and we're building out more and more policies of what we do and don't allow uh, on our platform. We've also, you know, with wars going on around the world, uh, we've introduced a WhereBiz uh, process because right now if in a legal country and you have access to the internet, you can sign up for our product. And so you know, how do we think about that? So we've, we, we're continuing to just grow up as a company and put policies uh, in place um, that make our platform safer and better for our customers and make uh, it a platform that our employees feel, feel good about uh, working with. Tom, this has been fascinating. Thank you for your time. Absolutely. Now, if there is one thing that you'd like a startup entrepreneur or growth CEO to take away from this conversation, what would it be? Yeah, ultimately, it still comes down to people. Uh, It comes down to having the right people in the right place uh, at the right time, having people in place that you can align with, uh, disagree with, uh, and go get things done, having people that have a focus and a bias to action that can be uh, great individual contributors, but also can be great team members uh, and that, that want to play to win, that want to to do something great. And it's been the case in every role and every job, no matter what kind of, of business that I'm in. Uh, in technology, because we're always hiring so many people, um, sometimes you, you take the lens down from that and you just look at pure skills more so than, you know, the right fit and mindset to do uh, what you're trying to do. You sometimes try to go too fast. You know, we need a hundred engineers. You let down your standards for diversity or for the right mixtures of skill sets and, um, and you pay a price for that. And so I I know we've seen that in traditional industries over the years uh, and it's front and center in the technology space uh, today. So that focus on people and culture and getting that, right or going back and fixing it and making sure that it's right for going forward uh, is an investment that'll pay off over and over again for you more so than really almost anything else that you could do. Kaiser is clearly a people person. It was evident in our time together. And for this growth oriented CEO, success means finding the right people, then treating them right. From instituting time away, adjusting to the realities of working under COVID-19, to listening when they push back in areas of social concern. Artificial intelligence is clearly a key technology, not just for the future, but for today. And for Tom Kaiser, moving the company in that direction isn't just intelligent, it shows his street smarts. I'm Michael Hainsworth. Thanks for listening.